Well, hello everyone. It's the week before Thanksgiving 2020. I hope you're thankful. I hope you can stay focused enough to be thankful. And I think that's probably what uh, partially what I'm to do today is um, maybe give us an ability to focus and remember that thankfulness is a benefit all of its own. Um, a couple weeks ago, probably maybe well, maybe almost a month ago now, I had an invitation to speak at a at a small revival, and I, I of course you know you you get invited some portion of time beforehand, and you have some time to prepare. And I I knew my portion was to be about um, unity, you know, and you never know who's coming, how many different church bodies are going to be at one meeting, and and different. You don't know, you never know who you're going to speak to. You just the way I do it. I don't worry about who's going to be there, who's not going to be there. I try to focus, there's that word focus again, on, um, okay, Lord, you know who's going to be there, and you know what they need to hear. So for the conference, uh, I just I just felt like the Lord was telling me to speak on unity. And I went into Psalms 133 briefly and uh, kind of laid a foundation, um, and then I was... I went into Paul's teaching uh, with the Philippian people in chapter 2 where he's encouraging them, hey, prefer one another. Don't be careful that you're biting and devouring one another lest you be consumed. And and the whole message was um, about the dangers of mistreating one another within the body of Christ. Well, as I was teaching that Psalm 133, uh, it's only three verses. So, but don't be, uh, there's a lot in those three verses. And, but I briefly went over verses one and two, and although I read verse three, I left a lot of meat on the bone because I just didn't have the time to go into everything was there. And today I feel like I'm supposed to lay a brief foundation with verses one and two on my way to verse three because verse three is huge. Verse 3 is, is absolutely incredible. So I want to spend uh, the majority of my time on verse 3 and explaining what verse 3 is referencing. Now before we get started, let's remember that most of the Psalms in the book of Psalms were written by King David. Now there was uh, uh, a guy named Ezra, there was the sons of Korah, there was a guy named, uh, I think his name was Ethan the Ezraite, <laughs> there's a word for you, that wrote like Psalm 89. But David was the one that God mostly used to write the Psalms. And let's realize, David was not just the greatest king, he was also like a type and shadow of Jesus. He was a priest. Even though he was not a Levite, he was from the tribe of Judah, David learn in the sheepfold how to minister and have relationship with the Lord and out of that relationship David was very very prophetic in fact a lot of his Psalms he references the coming Messiah Jesus so David was a king a psalmist a priest in a sense and a prophet a very very much a prophet so this Psalm 133 is referred to as a song of, uh, of degrees. And what that means is when the people of Israel would be coming to the temple, whether it was their annual trek or maybe they were there a lot on their way there, or sometimes this was used at the beginning of their services, what this psalm would be sung or recited for was to focus everyone on the benefits of their relationship with the Lord. And it's, it's that idea, this song of degrees, that they would sing this or, or recite this even on their ascension. It's sometimes rather than a song of degrees, it's called a song of ascension. As they would be walking up the steps to the Temple Mount, they would be reminding themselves about me. And it was just certain psalms that are called the psalms or the songs of degrees or the songs of the ascension. And the ones that were of that nature, 
they were always provided to provide focus on the purpose of going and on the purpose of, of focusing on who's most important. And that's one of the, this is one of those Psalms that is to focus on our relationship with the Lord. It's only three verses, like I said, but David starts out and he says, Behold, King James Version, Behold, look closely, how good and how pleasant it is that the brethren dwell together in unity. Behold, how good and how pleasant. The word good there is the Hebrew word tov. And when you look up tov, there's so many adjectives, but it's basically good, pleasant. It's a good deal. How good and how pleasant it is when the brethren dwell even together in unity. The word even there in many of the older versions is, and, and when you look at a good reference Bible, it'll have the word even there. And what this is it, let, let's think about it as the song of degrees. He says how good and how pleasant it is when the brethren, the word brethren there is very important because it's still speaking of that family relationship. Now realize in the Old Testament, they really don't think of God as father. They think of him as taskmaster. They think of him as do good, get good, do bad, he'll reject us. David had a unique relationship and that's why a lot of times he's referred to as, as a type and a foreshadowing of Jesus because he saw God as more of a father figure than his contemporaries. So when you think about this, he says how good and how pleasant it is that the brethren dwell even together in unity. You don't have brethren without a father. The, the insertion of the word brethren there speaks of family. And that's very key and very important to understand what he's trying to convey to us, the value of unity. He says that it's good and it's pleasant that the brethren dwell evenly together in unity. I said all that to say this. I'm not speaking of a unity between people, per se. I'm speaking of a unity that occurs between people because they're genuinely focused on one common goal, the Father, seeking the Father seeking what his will would be. How do you see this? I think it would be key for us in these perilous times if we could focus and see things from his perspective and realize that the enemy's whole agenda is to keep us divided and consuming one another. I notice I, I referenced Philippians 2 of my previous uh, message. Paul warned them, he said, be careful that you don't bite and devour one another, lest you be consumed one of the other. That's happening, and it's falling right into the enemy's, in the, in the enemy's you know, desires. So, how good and how pleasant it is that the brethren, the family of God, dwell evenly together in unity with the Father. And then he, in the, in the next two verses, he gives us metaphors. He gives us things. He says, it is like the second verse. I'll go ahead and read it to you. 33 verses, not real hard for me to memorize, but I'll read it to you. Still talking about unity. Keep this in mind. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. Remember, Aaron was the first high priest, Moses' brother that went down to the skirts of his garments. Okay, he's comparing unity to the anointing oil that would come upon the high priest. They would pour it over his head. And he says unity is like that ointment that it would run down to his beard and to his garments and down to the skirts of his garments. Anointing doesn't just run off anointing soaks the presence of God if we'll stay focused in this song of degrees 
that unified focus creates an anointing that flows evenly together. We have to keep in mind that here on earth, now let's run this through the cross just a little bit. Next week we're going to really run this one through the cross, but let me just give you a little precursor to that. You always have to take Old Testament scriptures and see how they're enhanced because of what Jesus did. Okay? This is one of those instances. In the New Testament, because of our union with Christ, as he is, so are we, in this world, we are now called, because of him and our union with him, we are now called kings and priests. Okay? So this is not just for one person. This is not just for the pastor of the church or the apostle. It's because he's encouraging us to, to prefer one another. To stay even we all have different functions and there are you know opportunities to to honor those that labor among us but what he's saying here is keep our focus on him you do your part and have this one do his part but maintain the fact that we're all under him okay so the 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 flow down is not necessarily through people but the flow down is from God the Father now, one more thing. In the Old Testament, it came down. But see, now because of what Jesus did, it comes from within. The Spirit of God has now joined himself to you. And so it's no longer just pouring down. It's still from the Father, but he came down. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, as the old song goes. Okay, you're with me. So he says unity is like that anointing oil. And the key thing here is it saturates everything dependent on your level of, of unity. Okay, that's, that's one thing we can take away from this. In verse 3, it says this, though. Still speaking of unity. He says it's as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. Now let's think about that. In David's time, he's speaking of Mount Hermon. He says unity is like the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. Mount Hermon is north of Jerusalem. In fact, in David's time, Mount Hermon was part of his conquered territory. But as you look at a modern day map and any time before David, Mount Hermon was Syria. Mount Hermon's a little bit southwest of Damascus. But as of current 2020 maps, Mount Hermon's in Syria. But the, the ironic thing that takes place in the nation of Israel, you, you have to realize water is a very valuable commodity. Water is more valuable than most anything in that arid des desert environment. Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in that region. And when it says the dew would come onto Mount Hermon, any bit, bit of moisture that came onto Mount Hermon flowed down. And if you have a map of, of that region, Mount Hermon, the dew and the rains that came on Mount Hermon is what flows into the River Jordan that goes from north to south through Israel and comes right into, into Jerusalem. Mount Hermon was the headwater of the Jordan River. And in fact, just not to give you too much detail, but there was later a king that tapped into the Jordan River and this is amazing considering the time. He made an aqueduct and, and it ran right into Jerusalem. Remember the story of Jesus uh, healing the paralyzed man at the Pool of Siloam? The Pool of Siloam is fed by that aqueduct that came off the River Jordan that flows from the mountain of Hermon. Now realize this, just uh, try not to get into too much detail here, but it's important that you know this. Realize he's saying the dew of Hermon. He's not saying the torrential rain. This is important. I've been meditating on this for a while. This is what I, I believe the Lord showed me. 
Here I am in West Virginia. I know a little bit about gardening and farming, just kind of osmosis. I'm not a real big gardener myself, but I have flowers. I've had a garden. If you've watched my, my videos on my good friend Tom Sawyer, how he taught me to garden. But I realized back then that for the West Virginia farmer, you don't want a torrential downpour that gives you an inch of rain in an hour. You don't want that. You want one of those nice spring, slow, steady, saturating rains. That's the thought here. Unity saturates. The original context of the, of the created world was not rain coming down. It didn't start raining until Noah's flood. I don't know how many people know that. It didn't rain until Noah's flood. The way the earth was watered was it would come up as do in the evening and the waters would come up out of the earth and and irrigate everything it didn't come down it came up and that's the thought here unity as long as we're focused on his way of seeing things will just saturate and 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 truly be a place where growth can occur i don't know how many of you have been in one of these services I hope a lot of you, but not everyone has. Maybe I can make you a little jealous for one of these services if you haven't. Have you ever been in one of those meetings where, to whatever level you come in, uh, you might be heavy about something, you might have relationship issues, you may have financial problems, you may be sick in your body, or your kids are, you know, having issues. Have you ever had one of the gone to one of those services where the presence of God is so strong? that whatever level of heaviness you walked in with, all of a sudden it just doesn't matter. You are saturated by the presence of God. It's that unity that occurs that brings a, a tangible manifestation in your midst to where for that moment, <laughs> and it usually lasts for a while, maybe till you go to bed that night and then you may wake up with it and it may have some lingering effects, but unless you continue to tap into that unity even by yourself you'll lose it okay what he's saying here is unity is like that dew that's on the ground and it's just watering everything water moisturizes water keeps things pliable water can over you know if you you keep things oiled and watered the, the metaphors here are anointing oil and water if you can keep your leather seats oiled and pliable they don't crack think of this in unity how good and how pleasant it is that the brethren dwell even together in unity that word tov good good and pleasant when you look it up, it even speaks of economic benefits. Think of even synchronicity. When you have two people working together to do something, the law of synchronicity says that two united can do more than two separate. Just the fact that they're working together, synchronicity takes place and what happens if you get everyone on the same page? I might need to inject this. The reason it's important that it be a focused unity that is a result of focus on, on the Lord, even independent of God, you get a group all have one goal, one purpose. You can win football championships. You can do all kinds of th great things here on this earth. And remember, that's why God had to send down and confound the languages because there was a unified group building a tower of Babel and he came down and confused their language. Why do you bring that up? Because it is imperative, back to Paul's teaching in Philippians 2, that we all be saying the same thing. Not attacking what you're saying versus what I'm saying, if we'll look to the Father and not be so quick to attack, 
but our purpose is to not tear down one another but to focus on what he would have me say focus on what I'm to do in this ministry this worldwide kingdom of God ministry and then let them worry about themselves I'm not going to be on the internet tearing down what this one's saying and that one's saying and that needs to stop that absolutely needs to stop because it's a good and pleasant thing when the brethren this is talking about the family of God here when we dwell together in unity okay <laughs> here's coming the meat of what I came here to say to you today Unity is like the dew of Hermon as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there, the Lord commanded the blessing and even life forevermore. What's that about? He says, it's like the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. Think seven mountain theology that's going on right now. How we've, we've come to understand that there are levels of influence throughout the world and it's time for God to, to, for the people of God to begin to influence all these seven mountains whether it be the political structures or the church structures or the media structures well, all the seven mountains all the places of influence in our world what would happen if unity would descend upon all those mountains he says here it's like the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion because it is there that he commanded the blessing, even life, abundant life, forevermore. That phrase, there, the mountains of Zion, he commanded the blessing. To the Jewish mind, they know what he's talking about. Us Gentiles, we kind of got to do a little history research. The first mention, it's mentioned three times, as I recall. But that phrase, commanded the blessing, is in direct reference to where Moses is receiving instructions from God in Leviticus chapter 25. Now, those of you that know me well and have followed this ministry for years, Pastor Darren's going to Leviticus. Hang on. In Leviticus 25, it's... Before the nation of Israel goes into the promised land, God is giving Noah, or Noah, God is giving Moses instruction. When you get there, I want you to do this. And specifically where he's speaking about commanding the blessing, it's, it's in reference to the Sabbaths. In the beginning portion of chapter 20, I'm going to cut out a lot of stuff. So just, you can go read this for yourself. In the beginning part of Leviticus 25, he's speaking of every week, every, actually every every seven years, I want you to take a year off. He said, I want you to plant and harvest for six years, and then that seventh year, I don't want you to plant. I don't want you to prune. I don't want you to harvest even what just comes up and grows. Here in West Virginia, we call those volunteers. You know, you didn't plant it. You didn't plant a garden this year, but still some stuff comes up. We call those volunteers. Well, that's what happened. Now, let's keep this in mind. We'll take you to the scripture here in just a second, but let me give you the background here. The first seven, eight verses, he's speaking of those uh, six years and then the seventh year have a Sabbath rest, just like we do uh, every week, seven days in the week, seventh day is the Sabbath, right? It's a time of resting. When Moses is receiving this instruction, you'll see when you go back to Leviticus 25, verse 1, he says that that seventh year is for the land to rest. Now, he's giving this instruction, as I said, to Moses before he even goes to the promised land. He's telling them beforehand how life is going to go well once they get there. Now, let me interject this. Just my random thought. I, I, I like to tell you when this is just me thinking, but I've been meditating on this. Remember at some point in time, and I believe it's most likely, I haven't done the research, but it's most likely after this encounter with God that Moses is receiving instruction of 
how they're supposed to cultivate the land and how they're supposed to, to you know, utilize the land once they get there. Remember at some point they sent spies over and they found it. Sure enough, there's giants in the land and the produce is so big and so fabulous that it takes two men to carry a cluster of grapes. That's some big grapes. Two grown men have to carry one end. The grapes are so big. I believe that the giants understood this principle. What do you say that? Not to get into a whole theological discussion and get a lot of people upset. But I've spoken about this before. The giants were descendants of fallen angels having intercourse with women. That's where the giants came from. They weren't stupid. These fallen angels knew how the world was created. They understood natural physics. They understood how natural things work and they controlled information. There, there's a lot. I watched a thing by Perry Stone today that was so phenomenal because I was getting rid of, I had all these things in my head and he was, he was correlating the fact that, that the tech giants now are like the giants of old. They're controlling information. They're controlling what's going on in our world. But anyway, I submit this to you. The giants understood natural things. So much so that they were so intimidating, not just by their size, but the size of their intellect. They could do things that normal men didn't understand. There were secrets that they understood, and it's honestly the wisdom of many of our secret societies today. Not to get too controversial, but let's think about this. Those ancient structures that you saw in Egypt, the pyramids and all the different things that they they would have trouble reproducing now. How in the world did, were they smart enough to do all these things? The intellect of the giants. The giants, I believe, understood this concept of having a Sabbath rest. The problem is the nation of Israel never really embraced it. Now, there's another portion in chapter 25 that I won't go into too much today because it's not relevant to today. But he also speaks of the cycle of seven Sabbaths. Every seventh year, you had a Sabbath year of rest. But every seven sevens, every cycle of sevens, you had not only the 49th year would be the seventh cycle. It was a, a year of rest, but also then the next year you had a year of jubilee. That's a whole other subject. But here in, let me get to Leviticus 25. Here in Leviticus 25, and we'll pick up with verse 18. It says, Wherefore ye shall do my statutes. This is God speaking to Moses. You're going to do what I'm telling you to do. You will do my statutes and keep my judgments, my ways of doing things, and do them. And you shall dwell in the land in safety. That word safety there, when you look it up, it's basically speaking of safety as in a place of refuge. But it's speaking not only just a, a natural or, you know, he, he's, he's speaking of, of these um, Sabbaths. But what he's telling you is you won't have to worry about food. You won't have to worry about if you'll just follow my instructions, if you'll do things the way I'm telling you to, it'll go well with you. And you won't need to worry that it's a mental refuge. How many of us worry so much about what's going to happen and then once the time comes, we look back and think, oh, what was I worried about? And we had all that time of worry that was robbed from us. And he's saying, just stay in faith. Now, here, here's the cool thing. He's getting to where he commanded the blessing. He says, and the land shall yield her fruit and you shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. It's that same word. And if you shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather or our increase. Verse 21 is where he says, then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year. 
and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. I'm going to end with this, but it's going to take me a little while. Just warning you. Ponder this with me. Six years you can plant. Ahead of time, I'm telling you, the seventh year, I don't want you to plant anything. I don't want you to harvest anything. I don't even want you to prune your vineyards. I want you to let the land rest. He says, when you get to that sixth year and you're preparing to go to the seventh, what are we going to eat? What, we're not even going to sow the seventh year. He said, I'm that sixth year, you're not only going to get your annual normal yield. You're going to get that one, and then you're going to get two more. You're going to get enough for three harvests. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a garden, but the work starts during harvest time. It, it takes enough to, to plant and to toil the, till the soil and all, planting that garden. But the real work starts when the beans start growing. The real work starts when it's, you know, harvest time and then you've got to can everything then you've got to put up the preserves and then that, that's when the work starts imagine not just your annual yield but you got three times as much because you're he says you're going to eat this that seventh year and the eighth year and part of the ninth year you're going to get an, but see the thing of it is when you are tempted to plant that seventh year where are you going to put it you got three years where it doesn't take a whole lot of faith to think i got enough to get me through three years he gives it to you ahead of time i, I think there's a i think this is pertinent to to the season we're coming into i've been talking about double for a long time now they get not only that yield for that year but they get a double blessing too it doesn't take a lot of faith when you got it in the barn the thing of it is, they understood God's system. Or at least they should have, because you have the instruction here. You have six years to prepare for the yield that you're going to get. You better take year two, year three, year four, year five, because you're going to have three times. Your barns need to be big. You need to have enough mason jars, if you understand me, to not waste it all. Not to mention... You can imagine people, well, I get tired of all these mason, these preserves that are canned. I want some fresh things. You, they were allowed to go out and eat what they wanted. They just couldn't preserve it. They just couldn't put it up for storage. They were allowed to turn the cattle out. They were allowed to, to allow the, the different people to come in and glean, the hungry people to come and glean. There was enough volunteer, but see, they never did it. They missed the whole idea of Sabbath. We've got to embrace. He's saying unity. Let me bring it back to full circle. He's saying unity is like that Sabbath. He's bringing it out of agriculture into personal relationships and our relationship with the Father. See, if they would listen to God, the Sabbath would work agriculturally. David is bringing it on, a, on another level for us. Remember, David was a prophet. The entire New Testament is based on the sure mercies of David. Next week, we'll look at this in a more practical New Testament way, but I had to lay this foundation. The Sabbath is where he commanded the blessing on the mountains of Zion. Unity on the mountains of Zion will yield the commanded blessing. Let's meditate on this, whatever our part is, but let's make sure we preserve and actually magnify the word of the Lord here to do our part with unity among the brethren. Among the brethren. Sometimes there's corrections that needs made. Maybe it's not you. 
sometimes maybe just do your part that that's my thing just do your part don't worry about someone else's part let God worry about all that. let God take care of all that but he's saying behold his first word in this whole psalm was behold look closely it's a key word look closely at the value of the commanded blessing of unity there's a commanded blessing I don't want to just get by I believe God is commanding me at this time has been for years prepare for abundance prepare for abundance this is a key part of that this is an absolute key part of that until our hearts are right unified with him and everybody looking to him it will create a unity between people groups if we will all focus on him and not worry about what's wrong with this one and what's wrong with that one if we will sell out to unity among the brethren how much of a harvest will we see well this says it's there in unity he commanded the blessing I pray that you can hear this I pray that that you can receive this I pray that we can all I don't even think I've got it all yet I know it here but I need to know it here it's time for us to behold the word of the Lord and allow the commanded blessing to and the belief in it that we don't need to control one another we don't need to correct one another as much as we do allow that singular focus you just do your part stay focused on him do your part for unity do your part don't worry about someone else's part do your part and to the level that we all come into this unifying perspective will depend how much of an influence we have in this world amen i pray you got something out of this Next week, we're going to look in more practical, more New Testament um, perspective of this because uh, I've just got something special for you next week. It'll make a lot of sense next week if you if you maybe you want to watch this again right before next week. So I pray that you be blessed. Happy Thanksgiving early. I hope you can be with your family either virtually or in the same room. I, I don't know how everyone's doing it, um, but you do you do what's good for you but also let me encourage you how about preferring someone else putting someone else's needs someone else what they're going through maybe they're afraid of COVID maybe they're not just prefer one another you do you and don't bite and devour because someone else is not like you amen God bless you have a great Thanksgiving <laughs>